Good afternoon and welcome to the show. I'm Jim Fleisick. During today's show, we will discuss best practices with emergency communication strategies in the federal government. With me today on the show are Rear Admiral Ron Hewitt, the Director, Office of Emergency Communication, Department of Homeland Security, Laurie Flaherty, the Coordinator of the National 911 Program, Department of Transportation, T.J. Kennedy, the President, FirstNet, Wade Whitmer, the Deputy Director, Integrated Public Alert and Warning Systems Program, Mark McNulty, the Vice President and Senior Director, Motorola Solutions, and Mike Maiorena, the Senior Vice President, Verizon Enterprise Solutions Public Sector. Let's get into the, let's talk about progress that we've been seeing over the last year or so. Let's start with uh, Rear Admiral Hewitt. Ron, um, can you tell us uh, some examples of progress you're seeing in the emergency communication and preparedness area? Uh, yes, Jim. Uh, public safety communications is going through unprecedented, unprecedented change uh, with the deployment of, of uh, multimedia systems enabling data, video and data from a predominantly, which was right. uh, voice only systems and, and with the advent of uh, next generation 911, FirstNet and cellular alert and warning systems. To ensure all these systems work seamlessly together, uh, with the current land mobile radio systems, we're working with SAFECOM uh, to update the National Emergency Communications Plan, which is the roadmap for ensuring interoperability. SAFECOM is a national level governance body focused on interoperability that is comprised of public safety leaders representing the nation's first responder community and organizations that represent state, local, tribal, and territorial government leaders who provide funding to support public safety. To help implement the plan, we partnered with the National Governors Association, which is a SAFECOM member, to conduct a policy academy on enhancing emergency communications interoperability. Policy academies are done for important issues that are concerns to the governor. We are now assisting all 56 cool. states and territories with implementing these Great. plans. Fantastic, fantastic. T.J. Kennedy, FirstNet, that's certainly uh, exciting. Uh, it's a lot in the news a lot and um, looking forward to it. It uh, uh, has tremendous potential and I know you've brought it a long way. Can you give us an example where you are in making progress with FirstNet? Yeah, it's been a very exciting year. I mean, earlier this year we were able to solidify a public-private partnership to deliver on the network that public safety fought to get. Mm -hmm. And really, it's public safety's network. They went to Capitol Hill and fought for Spectrum and funding. And at the end of the day, we needed to create a public-private partnership that would ensure not just the building and the operation of the network, but the upgrades and the ability to sustain this network for the next 25 years. And we solidified that in March of this year when we were able to get into a public-private partnership with AT&T. And they've committed to invest billions of dollars to make sure that this network happens for public safety. And what's so great is public safety hasn't always had the opportunity right. to really use the rich you know, video and data applications that all of us are, are used to enjoying. It's the 10 year anniversary right. of the iPhone. Right. Uh, but today, most first responders don't have the same capabilities as most 15 year old children when it comes to those communication tools. Now with FirstNet, they'll be able to look in the upper left hand corner of that iPhone, that, that Samsung device, that Android device, what have you, and see the words FirstNet there. And that's gonna mean to them that that phone and that device has the ability for encryption, priority, preemption, a public safety applications ecosystem, all of the rich things that right. they need to do their job more effectively and safer. Wow, long time coming. I mean, I ran Secret Service Communications for four years and the way I did interoperability is I put like four radios in the back seat and say, if you want to talk to the local police, use that radio. If you want to talk to the FBI, use this radio. If you want to talk, and that's the way it was. And you know, there'd be 15 antennas on the roof of the car and so forth. So this is a, a real milestone in, in improving communications. Uh, Mark McNulty, when we talk Motorola Solutions, I guess when I think of Motorola Solutions, I think this is a, sort of your sweet spot, you know, communications and uh, you have a long gr a positive reputation of doing some great stuff there. How, what are you seeing in progress these days in, in uh, uh, in, in from your vantage point and supporting your customer base. So, so obviously, uh, to the point of industry, supporting government and their efforts, um, and Admiral Hewitt mentioned interoperability. You talked about the four radios sure. in the back. Obviously, we've seen a lot of progress over the years with sure. the, the advent of multiband radios to make that simpler and, and get the four radios out of the trunk. Um, but I think interoperability is really part of the key here, whether we're talking about standards-based radios and, and how we continue to modernize LMR networks. Uh, and we talk about additional devices in the future. TJ mentioned the iPhone and the Samsung. We certainly hope um, that there'll be some Motorola devices out there, more purpose-built devices designed for public safety, um, and in a variety of form factors, including 
um, collaborative devices where there might be a traditional LMR radio with a collaborative broadband device and they work with one another, back each other up, uh, all the way up to converged devices that include both technologies um, or, or perhaps some users may decide one is, is all they need, one or the other as opposed to two. So a lot of work around uh, supporting both uh, the interoperability requirements of the users um, and a lot of work we're doing around really understanding user needs. Mm -hmm. um, we'll talk more about that as we go. Yeah, excellent. Uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, understand those requirements and, and, and move forward. Uh, Wade Whitmer at FEMA. I guess when I think of FEMA, you know, emergency communications and preparedness uh, sort of comes to mind um, when you think FEMA. So how, how's progress there in terms of uh, uh, FEMA in, in this space? Oh, very well. And uh, of course at FEMA, we are all emergency managers. Mm -hmm. uh, I, in particular, work specifically only in the uh, integrated public alert and warning system, which uh, for a quick review is just uh, the system that enables uh, public safety officials at any level of government. And in some cases, we're seeing some private sector sponsored by a public safety official uh, get a message, an urgent message, emergency message out to the public uh, through partnership with our private sector uh, network. So uh, through iPaws, we're seeing uh, those officials be able to leverage uh, broadcast, radio and TV, still a very important way to get messages to the public in an urgent matter. And then now the newest piece, uh, wireless emergency alerts, are cell phones. So mm -hmm. the ability to put a short message onto a cell phone in a geographic specific sort of area uh, and give people really an alert uh, quickly and get them to tune to additional sources or give them an action to do is, uh, is what iPause is doing. So. Yeah. We're that middleware. Um, really, uh, over the last year, uh, we have been, of course, since about 2012, working to bring as many public safety agencies up to speed and, and uh, on the ability to use that system. And then over the last year, we're starting to see increased usage. So uh, we are trying to loop back around to help them with training and examples of what their partners or what the, their peers are doing with the system. And um, so increased usage recently, uh, some very creative uses, right. usages of it, which I'll talk about a little later also, and, um, and public sentiment. So we are seeing now the public starting to understand that, hey, um, uh, I can get a, a safety message, an alert, a warning on my cell phone. Mm -hmm. And there's a growing expectation in several uh, things over the last six months uh, that are following the news where the public's saying, hey, why didn't you send me that message to my cell phone? Right. Uh, so um, yeah. that's kind of uh, yeah. been a real progress for us. Things, over the are, last things year. are moving along. And I also say, I mean, read almost every day in the trade press where FEMA's doing different kinds of grants with first responders and looking at next te generation technologies, trying to stay ahead of that curve to make sure you're uh, offering what's the, the best that's out there. So, um, Larry Flaherty at uh, DOT, um, I'm excited to hear, hear about the 911 program and progress made. We had we talked to you about it once before. I'm excited to hear about the progress that has been going on in the past year. Well, thank you, Jim. Uh, not only is it the first uh, or the 10th anniversary of the iPhone, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the first 911 call, which was made in 1968. 50th anniversary. Yeah. So a lot of you know so much progress has been made in, in the 50 years, and we, we're ta taking the opportunity to measure exactly how much progress the states have made in terms of upgrading their own 911 systems. So we're collecting data from the states and we're also completing a two-year project to figure out how much it's going to cost our country to finish that process uh, from where the states are now. So we think both of those tools will be very useful not only to the states in terms of figuring out how they measure up against each other but also for policymakers in terms of uh, how much you know support the states are going to need to pull that off? Excellent, excellent. We can drill down on some of that too as yeah. the show goes on. Uh, Mike, over at Verizon, tell us uh, some of the progress you see in emergency preparedness, uh, emergency communication sure. preparedness with the customer base that you're supporting. Yeah. And then that customer base is first and foremost in our mind. We've had a decades of experience mm -hmm. in supporting mission critical communications for our government customers nationwide, and have developed that trust. Uh, on the back of our reliable network, the densification of our network, the coverage, the capacity, and the applications that can ride over that network, such as priority services. At Verizon, we're all about understanding the end user mission and fortifying our network, um, spectrum allocation, uh, small cell uh, deployments, so when the sun is shining and the sky is blue, it, things work. Right. But we also have a terrific uh, disaster recovery 
a business continuity asset uh, that we can bring to bear with deployable cell, uh, cells on light trucks, cells on wheels. Right. We're making uh, cells in a backpack now, uh, oh, wow. LTE, 4G LTE nodes in a backpack. All while, we, all while we start to invest in building the fiber across the country for the backhaul ultimately to deliver 5G. Yeah, excellent, fantastic. Um, let's talk about a little bit more specific things here. Our, our listening audience all, also likes to, always likes to hear about a specific program or something you know, that makes it real, like this is a, something that is go going to happen. Let's start this time with TJ at FirstNet. TJ, if I ask you to point at a, sort of a specific program you have in your mind for FirstNet, what, what comes to mind? I think one of the unique things is the network is going to be so critical, and now that we've deployed the the 50 plus plans out to the 50 different states for what's going to happen on the network, we can now start thinking about the exciting things that will ride on the network. And to me, that's going to be applications. Mm -hmm. And when you look at public safety, having the ability to uh, interface with our legacy systems like Land Mobile Radio, Mark talked about on the right. Motorola side, and Motorola is a partner of FirstNet and what's happening. And I think mm -hmm. what's so critical is that people are going to be using things beyond voice. And when you look at the applications that are out there, part of the FirstNet legislation put aside $300 million for, for grants that are very focused on building that application ecosystem. And as part of that, the first $38.5 million worth of grants were just recently awarded. And they're going to be bringing things like augmented reality, really looking at you know resilient computing, looking at mission critical push to talk and how that can go to device device communication on a cellular broadband device on FirstNet, looking at real time video and, and all the different things that are going to happen both on 4G as well as 5G in the future. And one of the great things about the first network is we're funded to be able to upgrade and add 5G to that net network, add 6G in the future, and that's something that public safety just hasn't had where right. we knew we were going to be on track with what's happening in the exciting commercial world. Now we're always going to be at the same place or at the forefront of that. Wow. Fantastic. Um, yeah, that real-time stuff I've said in this show a number of times, we're approaching a, a world where we're living, where decision-making, where time is approaching zero. I mean, things, decisions are going to have to be made I immediately, you know, especially when you're in emergency uh, preparedness and issues around that. Uh, Wade Whitmer, uh, what, if I asked you about a specific program, what, what would come to mind in terms of you know, an application that you see as a program that you'd like to mention? Yeah, and again, I'll talk to, especially from the public perspective and, and uh, the alerting authority users today, those wireless emergency alerts um, mm -hmm. through uh, really, we, uh, that gives public safety officials the, right now the capability to leverage, I'm going to say billions of dollars of uh, cellular industry mm -hmm. infrastructure. And works with all manufacturers, all phones, it does. all technium, right. iPhones, Android. Yep. Uh, I'd say almost uh, approximately in 2014, almost every phone that was new coming onto the, the networks uh, was able to receive wireless emergency alerts. Wow. So um, the biggest thing we got, uh, and, and a new change is there's actually um, just now starting to work with the industry interface standards bodies for upgrades to that. So uh, today that capability is a 90 character text message only to a cell phone. Um, it's broadcast, so it's not connection oriented. Um, nobody knows where those phones are. We don't know how many phones got it, but it's uh, right. but very effective at quickly putting a message across a whole bunch of phones. Yeah. Um, working with both uh, the private sector, the partners, and through our partners at the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, uh, we've uh, cut a deal to, to make the first changes to that. Namely, uh, big change is increasing that 90 characters mm -hmm. to 360 characters okay. so that you can push a lot Lot more information. Right. Now, does the um, alert go like come out from the federal, state, local, yeah, or all so, of the above? And I, it's always important to say that we FEMA don't send you alerts. Right. Yeah. Uh, we're just the facilitators, so right. we're in the middle. Um, so right now, yes, yeah, state, local, territorial, tribal. Mm -hmm. In the last uh, 12 months, we've brought three tribal uh, nations on board as alerting authorities also. Um, and it's really, when you get something on your phone, that's coming from somebody in your local area. Right. Uh, and we always are purveyors that uh, those guys should be the ones that they're in control of that message. Right. Um, everything's automated. Yeah. So, Excellent. Um, Fantastic. Uh, Larry Flaherty, uh, if I asked you to think of a specific program where nine, the next gen 911 will make a big difference, what comes to mind? Well, probably the biggest 
project we have going right now from the community's perspective is a grant program that we are managing that is specifically for the benefit of 911 public safety answering points. Um, during the next few months, we'll work our way through a process that has been established by Congress to make funds available to state and local jurisdictions. It's an implementation grant, so it is a grant uh, that will allow jurisdictions to upgrade their infrastructure to do a lot of the things that we're talking about this morning, to a, to a digital uh, internet protocol-based infrastructure that will allow not only the, the transfer of multimedia, but it, it creates a resiliency within the system that it doesn't have right now. I mean, the best example I can give you is during Hurricane Katrina, there were 38 of those 911 call centers that were taken completely out of operation. Yeah and those calls went nowhere. But in the state of Vermont, where they have this infrastructure during Hurricane Irene, one or two of their public safety answering points were taken, they had to evacuate during one of their highest call volumes ever, and no one in the state knew the difference. So that grant program is gonna make funds available to put that kind of infrastructure in place, and we're really looking forward to Excellent. that. Excellent, excellent. Um, <clears throat> Rear Hewitt, um, if I asked you to identify a specific program that you think is going to make a difference, what comes to mind? Well, whenever you have a major planned event, such as the 4th of July, uh, fireworks, parades, large sporting events, or major uh, unplanned incidents like hurricanes, tornadoes, or terrorist attacks, mm -hmm. it requires a coordinated response sure. from public safety, which includes law enforcement, firefighters, and emergency med uh, medical personnel uh, to respond in a coordinated manner. And the way they uh, form is through the incident command system. We're the program manager for the communications unit that drives interoperability across all the uh, public safety responders. And in, in doing so, we've uh, provided over a thousand technical assistance visits out with public safety and trained over 7,000 communications leaders and technicians to support that program. But we are now moving from not only just land mobile radio, but with FirstNet and broadband. So we're working closely with TJ and mm -hmm. FirstNet and FEMA to upgrade the com communications unit to enable uh, interoperability in both a land mobile radio and a uh, broadband long-term evolution uh, uh, capabilities. It's exciting to hear the coordination and collaboration going on. You know, one thing about this radio show that um, we've learned is, you know, as we've put pe folks together, somehow we're helping the collaboration process uh, uh, as people meet each other and move forward. And it just dawned on me, this radio program's older than the iPhone, but uh, I want to hear from Mike and Mark on this same subject when we come back from break. We need to take a short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm Jim Fleisick here with Rear Admiral Hewitt from the Office of Emergency Communication at DHS, Laurie Flaherty from Transportation, TJ Kennedy from FirstNet, Wade Whitmer from FEMA, Mark McNulty from Motorola Solutions, and Mike Myrana from Verizon Enterprise Solutions. We're talking emergency communications strategies and preparedness. When we went to break, we had heard from our government guest on uh, some of the specific programs that they think are going to make a difference. Mark McNulty, um, but when I ask you to, what comes to your mind in terms of identifying, say, a, an individual program you think is going to make a big difference? Well, in I, this think space? As we, I think as we look at emergency communications, you've really got the full spectrum represented here. Yeah. Um, you know, as TJ mentioned, um, Motorola is very proud to be part of the AT&T team that is part of the public-private partnership with FirstNet. Um, that's obviously a, a huge uh, development in public safety, probably the biggest development since the P25 standard for LMR. Um, I told I told TJ I'm jealous because I was trying to do these kinds of things for a long, long time. <laughs> he actually did it. <laughs> so that's at one end of the at one end of the emergency communication spectrum, and then obviously with Lori here from a from an NG911 perspective, that's kind of the input, right? Um, and so. Two very exciting programs, and I think um, as FirstNet and, and, and NG911 folks have recognized, right, it's, it's how those two things are now going to integrate to the benefit of you know, our citizens and to the benefit of our, uh, of our first responders um, that, that really is kind of the key, and it's where we're spending a lot of time, everything from you know, whether it's text to 911, video to 911, all of those inputs that are going to come in, um, all of those things now with a broadband network with priority and preemption that can now be delivered right. out to our to our first responders. Um, and we'll talk about it in the challenges, but it, it creates a challenge in sure. the middle of how do we parse through all of that data? Because right. we can't inundate 
the folks on the front line. We need to send them just that information uh, that they need and when they need it. Right. Um, and that's an area that we're working on. I think the other piece is, is we've talked about LMR, what people have right. used historically for mission critical voice and now broadband for both voice and data. Right. How do we integrate the two together? Right. How do we make it seem seamless to the point that we don't care which device the user right. carries or which network they're right. on, um, it all just works, similar to what Wade talked about right. with, with the emergency alerting, right? It's, it's exactly. technology agnostic, it's vendor agnostic, it's carrier agnostic. Exactly. And we that's don't, part we of what don't we're want multiple advices on that belt. We want a, an advice. Yeah, excellent. Wait till the kids get into this, work, into this space, guys. You know, you have to talk about some challenges coming down the road. Uh, <coughs> Mike, um, Myra, Anna from uh, Verizon, what's, if I ask you, um, a specific sure. program that comes to mind that you think really is making a difference that, uh, uh, that you're supporting? What, what, what comes to mind? So bottom line, everything rides on the network and the foundation of that network, coverage, reliability, the investments that we make yesterday, uh, today, and tomorrow to provide that application ecosystem um, that some of my peers here are talking about. Uh, we're really proud of our partnership with uh, Homeland Security, uh, Rear Admiral Hewitt in, in particular in OEC, in developing the next generation of wireless priority services for our public safety and first responder community. Uh, we've been a longstanding uh, partner of Homeland Security, providing federal, state, local law enforcement, public safety officials, a wireless priority service over a CDMA network. We now have that capability to deliver it over a LTE network and we were talking earlier, this is the 10 year anniversary of the iPhone. Without the LTE network, the iPhone wouldn't be what the iPhone is. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the capabilities that you have in your hand with a, with a high uh, broadband, high speed data uh, connection over an LTE uh, broadband uh, right. signal um, now is uh, in the hands of our first responders. We're real pleased to say that uh, we launched this at the, at, the, uh, at the Boston Marathon earlier this year. Uh, cool. partnering with law, local law enforcement and uh, it worked uh, flawlessly and we look forward to further uh, development. Excellent, excellent. Um, let's talk about some of the lessons you're learning along the way. We, we like to do that sort of a, as a public service thing for those listening to the show that are working in similar programs. Some of the things that maybe you learned along the way that uh, you pass on to others that uh, perhaps to help them move along. Let's start this time with Laurie Flaherty. Laurie, what are some of the lessons you're learning as you're uh, attempting to get these programs out there? I think one of the really basic things that we try and keep in mind is to really know your customer, to never forget who the people are that we serve. Uh, we take a lot of the cues for the projects that we manage and fund from our community, from, from the constituents, and we learn an awful lot from yeah, them. Um, we're, we're trying to showcase the examples and the experiences of early adopters of Next Generation 911 every chance we get, whether it's through articles or blogs or webinars. Uh, we're trying to allow them to share their experiences because there's an awful lot that they can learn from each other. And so we're trying to facilitate that process as much as we can. Yeah, well you do learn that, uh, lessons learned when you talk to the customers. A little quick story here, when I ran Secret Service Communication, <coughs> what did I learn? I came in uh, with the, the head of the president's detail to show them this really cool radio with all these buttons on it and you had to push this button for this, this button for this, this button, but then he threw it back on my lap and said, Jim, people are going to be shooting at me. You want me playing with these buttons? <laughs> so uh, you know, asking the customer is always a good idea. Um, uh, Ron, uh, you at that Rear Admiral, um, what are some of the lessons learning, learned along the way here for you? Well, the, the, the big lesson I've learned uh, being in the job is that, uh, especially working directly with public safety, is that interoperability isn't just a uh, yeah. technical issue. Being a uh, past uh, chief information officer, I tend to focus right on the uh, uh, the technology solutions, but uh, when you talk about interoperability, it's about the users of the equipment. It's a people issue, right. and, and what we found is that the biggest reasons for lack of interoperability is the lack of governance. Them working together before those incidents yeah. or big Excellent events point. to come up with the plans and, and the standard operating procedures, and that's really what our programs are driving at, yeah. is trying to get all the users uh, with that. And then the other thing is, is, is don't think you know what they need. You've got to have them be part Similar of the solution, and so we're very much a yeah, practitioner. And that thing is, is is interesting because you know I guess in, if something happens, you don't want everybody talking at the same time and everybody stepping on everybody, and no one knowing who's in charge, and uh, that could be total chaos. Uh, TJ, um, some of the lessons learned along the way with the FirstNet program uh, that you might want to pass on. 
I think one of the things we, we did best was really consulting with public safety. And it's very similar to what Ron and Lori are talking about in that we went out and asked public safety across all the states, what is it that they want in a, in a mission critical public safety broadband network? And we also did a massive data collection. We went out and, and really asked them for, you know, if you could have this kind of network, what kind of applications would you want? How would you utilize it? What's important to you? And we actually received responses from over 12,000 different public safety agencies wow. uh, representing about 2 million first responders in this country. I think it's the largest public safety data collection I'm aware of in the world, asking them what did they want in this network. And then what we did with that, and this is unique, I think, for, for a government agency, is we published that data. We actually put it out in our request for proposal with our statement of objectives for the network. And we said, this is what all the states are asking for. This is what public safety across the country is asking for. Please tell us how far you'll go. And then that created this, this, this large public-private partnership to serve those public safety customers. So it's really a network for public safety by public safety. And I think at the end of the day, that's going to pay huge dividends that the network will meet their needs. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, it's uh, the more collaboration that, I, that we see in programs, the more likely those programs succeed. Um, Wade Whitmer at, uh, over at FEMA, what uh, some of the lessons you're learning along the way here as you progress and try to move forward with these programs? Right, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, really follow on with that partnership and, in, and engagement piece too. Okay. Uh, first, little quick story is I, my second day at FEMA, I came from uh, Department of Defense projects doing special communications. Okay. And uh, second day on the job at FEMA, hadn't even met uh, my boss yet, uh, was drug into the meeting by our, uh, the political pointy in charge of the group that we're in, and uh, walked into a conference room with senior executives from Verizon and AT&T, uh, the FCC, and uh, DHS policy. And they said, uh, Wade, when are you going to get going on this wireless emergency alerts hey, thing? Been here two days. Come exactly. On. <laughs> they said, FEMA, you are holding up this critical public safety emergency communications program because we're waiting on you to finish the specification. And um, I walked out of that meeting. Lucky I didn't have to say anything. The senior, well, the senior said, "Don't worry, Wade. I'm just going to introduce you." Uh, and of course, I started in January, and that person was gone on January 20th. But um, uh, that kicked off really uh, starting to describe. We had to quickly figure out uh, the entire scope of what was expected, yeah. uh, and I, I think very important for that was bringing in uh, in, in the Department of Defense. We kind of owned our stuff end to end. Uh, looking at the budget line at, uh, that we had for this program, we weren't going to own anything end to end. Uh, we barely own a little piece in the middle, in fact. Uh, so we're heavily dependent on everybody else's stuff to work uh, and work, work uh, and to interoperate for those emergency alerts to get through. Um, Interesting on the job training experience yes. you had there. Um, <laughs> the learning curves, uh, we, uh, we said we're approaching a world where time's approaching zero, so learning curves are getting a little shorter. You know? <laughs> and I'd say, too, uh, budgets are shrinking. So the ability to leverage other people's uh, money, <laughs> in essence, other people's budget, not just in the private sector, but across government. So we leverage very early uh, DHS, uh, S&T, and uh, we continue to work very, very closely with Mr. Ute and the people that he's got out there to to help uh, uh, move the program certainly forward sense. certainly makes sense. I mean, in fact, you know, we were thrilled with the panel we got together today because we feel we've got the heavy hitters in this in this particular space. So um, it's real real nice to have you all together and hear about the collaborations going on. Let's hear from the, the private sector guest uh, panelists. Start with Mike this time. Mike, um, when I ask you, what are some of the lessons you're learning along the way that you might want to pass on to our listeners? Uh, what comes to mind? Consti uh, consistent engagement and collaboration with uh, our public uh, sector customers. A great example, uh, just last month in uh, Perry, Georgia, um, at the Guardian Center, uh, we hosted a, a private partner, uh, a private public partnership event uh, called Operation Convergent Response. We had more than 200 federal, state, and local first responders and over 40 industry partners attend an event uh, where we had uh, the Ninth Ward of New Orleans reenacted with yeah. water up to the roof, uh, a subway uh, fire, a collapsed building, and using the Verizon network, uh, 4G LTE network, um, software-defined perimeter technology, software-defined networking technology. We were able to deploy uh, drones, um, have uh, on-site um, uh, health uh, care mm -hmm. um, applications, um, and deliver command and control 
surveillance applications to our first responders. What was great about um, the, uh, the engagement was not only was uh, the uh, public um, sector customer exposed to the technologies and the capabilities um, of the uh, technologies and how it applies to their mission, but it got federal, state, and local together. And often uh, at the scene of a disaster, uh, man-made or, or, or not, uh, there's an opportunity right. for federal, state, and local uh, at the different jurisdictions um, from an all-hazards perspective to come together and understand con uh, their continuity of operation plan before the, the bad stuff really happens. And uh, we look forward to doing more of these events across the country. Yeah, I'll tell you it's so important to do that. If you don't do uh, contingency plans and disaster recovery, if you don't practice them, they're not gonna work. I mean, you know, you have to co continually re-drill so that it becomes sort of a standard operating procedure. Um, and, and be ready for, uh, to have to make changes, you know, things like that on the fly. Um, uh, Mark McNulty, when, uh, when uh, we talk lessons learned, what are some of the things come to your mind that you'd pass on to others? So I'd, I'd put it in three buckets. Okay. Um, I'll echo the, the sentiment around the table. I think the, the key is to focus on user needs. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, across the life cycle of, of an event, um, and across all of the different roles that our emergency responders um, play throughout their workday. Um, you know, our, our CTO's office tells us all the time, sometimes our first responders, they can't tell you what they do because they've been trained and it's, it's just muscle memory for them. Yeah. But if you watch them long enough, they'll show you. Right. So we spend a lot of time doing ride-alongs, focusing, just watching them do their jobs and looking for ways to improve. I think the second thing, you mentioned it with the example of the radio, is keep it simple. Right. Um, our, our emergency responders tell us all the time that you know, their jobs are many times yeah. you know, add hours of boredom or routine followed by moments of urgency. Right. It's got to work quick and I got to push a button and it's got to work. Well, and, and I need to know how to use it in those moments of terror right. when my cognitive ability, you know, just me muscle memory kicks in, I'm not really thinking. So it's right. got to be simple. Um, I think the third thing would be to learn from uh, the examples of the past or the lessons learned from the past. Uh, I was reading an article last week about the evacuations up in Fort McMurray up in Canada in the oil fields um, with the fires up there. Um, there was a university that did a study of all of the requests that were coming on all of the various applications. What they found was 88% of the things that people were looking for, where's food, where's water, where's gas, none of those were supported in the applications that were in use by the public okay. safety or by the public. So I think part of it is, while they may be telling us what they think they want, watching them and really understanding, leveraging right. the data from Excellent other points you know, exercises can help us understand, well, here's what we really need to build into the app because here's what people really care about. That's an excellent point. Excellent point. Learn from example, learn from past experiences and use it to, for continuous process improvement and just get better and better and better. Um, okay, so we talked about lessons. Now let's talk about the hard stuff, you know, the challenges, the, the things that you really, you know, the, those hurdles you got to get over in order to get where you want to want to be in the future. Um, let's start with Rear Admiral Hewitt again. Uh, uh, Ron, what are some of those difficult things or those challenges that you need to overcome to get your programs where you want them to be? Well, one of the major challenges public safety is facing today is securing funding for upgrading and maintaining their communication systems mm -hmm. and ensuring their employees are trained on how to use these new systems. Uh, many of them rely on federal grant dollars, which are getting less, but at the same time, uh, it's important that they understand how to uh, get a hold of federal grants. And so we publish the SafeCom grant guidance that provides mm -hmm. them information on which programs are out there and what are the allowable costs for those. But with the uh, unprecedented change moving to a multimedia systems, also c along comes opportunity, but also comes significant more risks. Right. Cybersecurity, uh, data storage, privacy, or just a, a few of the uh, the areas that they really haven't had to deal with in the past. And so we're uh, modifying our technical assistance programs to help them mitigate those risks. Yeah, and I thought about security as a, as a separate question, just a question around security, I, but wasn't sure if we'd have time to work it in, but uh, uh, should we uh, wind up with some time? It's an interesting, because um, I'm sure everyone has that issue. I mean, uh, that's sort of a given that that's a, a challenge. Uh, TJ Kennedy, what, uh, what are some of the challenges that you're facing that you still need to overcome to really get this program where you want it to be? And 
I think now that we're going to have a prioritized and preemptive network this year, and we're going to actually have an application store and ability to have full uh, redundancy and reconstitution of a network with deployables, and not just cells on wheels, but cells on wings. I mean, the reality that, that things are moving to, to drones and yeah. other aircraft that can bring us forward. It's just transitioning how we use communications. We, we are very good in public safety at relying on our land mobile radio systems, and they're going to be critical going forward. But that integration and then really leveraging these new tools that are now available in ways that we haven't before and to look past the tools that we have today. I think the younger generation of public safety, when I go out and talk to these 21-year-olds and 23-year-olds and 25-year-olds, they're digital natives. They've grown up with this technology, and they're more focused on how are they going to do this when it comes to you know, having a Siri-like or Alexa-like capability to be able to find information that they want mm -hmm. when they're responding to a call. So right. looking to the future, I think, is very critical. Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of things coming down the road, too, that are going to be interesting how they fit in, you know, things along machine learning and artificial intelligence and things along those lines that will figure into some of these programs. Uh, Wade Whitmer, uh, what are some of the challenges uh, that you see uh, as you try to work your way through the iPause program and get it to where you have the vision for it? Right. Uh, absolutely. A little bit of echo on, for TJ here is uh, keeping up. Uh, so keeping up on both sides. One, with the, the technology and the way things can move through the networks that are being built in the private sector out there. And then also with uh, the users, so, uh, not, to, not just the users but uh, that are sending the messages, the alerting authorities, but also the people are getting alerts. So they're, uh, they're moving forward, their devices are moving forward, their expectations and the way they consume and receive information is changing. Uh, you know, we kind of hope that we are uniquely positioned because we are just a middleware and all we really are is uh, using a, uh, an open pub, uh, information standard to, to be able to let those messages flow through networks, but absolutely keeping up, and also costs, uh, costs for the guys who need to send the alerts. Yeah. Uh, we do uh, uh, have language into the SafeCom grants and, and various grants that allow uh, folks on the front end, those public safety officials, to send uh, alerts, but they need to buy a piece of software to inter interface with iPaws. We don't have a front end. Mm -hmm. um, and they are competing in that shrinking grant dollar cost right. with uh, everything from uh, drug sniffing dogs to cybersecurity. Yeah. So uh, they have a, a large balance, a lot of stuff to, yeah. that they need to spend money on. We made decisions about priorities. Um, I want to hear from uh, Laurie, Mike, and Mark on this too, but we're going to need to first take a short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm Jim Flyzik here with Ron Hewitt from Homeland Security, Laurie Flaherty from Department of Transportation, T.J. Kennedy from FirstNet, Wade Whitmer from FEMA, Mark McNulty from Motorola Solutions, and Mike Myra-Anna from Verizon Enterprise Solutions. We're talking emergency preparedness. And, and uh, when we went to break, we were talking about challenges. And um, we've heard from uh, uh, some of our guests, but I want to hear from uh, Laurie Flaherty. Let's start off. What are some of the challenges, Laurie, that you face every day? Well, when I think about how we are going to succeed and and all of the new technology that that is available it's sort of a good news bad news thing I mean the good news is that there's multimedia available for first responders and that we can interact with a whole bunch of new right. new partners the bad news is there's all this new information right. out there and we can interact with all, a whole bunch of new partners um, and and so uh, you know I think all of us at, at this table here today have an enormous challenge because unless we end up with a seamless system that allows the caller to transfer that kind of multimedia to 911 and on to first responders and be able to alert the public, we will not have succeeded. Right. And that's not only a technological problem, as was mentioned, it's, it's a people issue as well. Um, so so the, you know, the people issues are the ones that are, are probably the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. The governance issues, as, as Admiral uh, Hewitt mentioned, the funding issues, I think those will be the huge challenges moving forward. Excellent, excellent. Mike, um, from your vantage point, what are some of the challenges you see in moving these programs forward? Earlier we were talking about cyber. Imagine a ransomware attack during a disaster response. Right. Uh, what would that do to the command and control capabilities of our first responders yeah. to, uh, to do their job? 
At Verizon, we believe we've got the technologies like end-to-end -end encryption, user credentialing, uh, software-defined uh, perimeter to get uh, secure connection to applications that are in the cloud to help uh, prevent, mitigate, deter, and respond to uh, cyber. But we all have to be focused on what do we need to do as a combined uh, public-private partnership uh, to identify and mitigate the cyber threats. Excellent point. Excellent point. So, again, you know, security is a, a, a inherent in everything you're doing, and uh, you know, I think we probably could do a show in and of itself just on security and communications. Uh, uh, well, we may do that sometime. Uh, Mark uh, McNulty, what do you see as some of the big challenges that um, you face day to day that you need to overcome to really get to where you want to be? So I think as we talk about the that's seamless system that, that Lori mentioned, right, end to end from the 911 call all the way out to that first responder, whether it's with voice, video, data, text messaging, whatever it is, um, and I talked about it earlier, it, it's the data overload, um, especially in those public safety answering points and in the right. command centers of all of this information coming in from the first responders on the scene who are streaming or sending that information back to citizens. Everybody has a cell phone and they all become a camera as soon as something happens nowadays. Um, all that information coming into the command centers and it's going to create a data overload in the command center. Yeah. Um, it's creating new roles and to the, you know, to the conversation about funding, obviously new roles and new people means you know, incremental funding or new funding um, for analysts, mm -hmm. people that can sit back and take all that information in, decide what's the most important, what's the most relevant, and decide what those little important pieces are, of information are that we want to send out to the, to the responders on the front line. Um, obviously, there's ways to do that. We're working on analytics, whether it's you know artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. you know video analytics, right. to help that analyst parse through all of the data, um, pick out the pieces that might be most important, then give it to a human and allow them to apply you know their domain sure. expertise and knowledge to what that person on the front line needs. But I think that data overload piece yeah. is important, and obviously, as the admiral talked about, threading that needle on ba the balancing act between security privacy concerns and yet being able to give our first responders what yeah. they need. Excellent points. We do a, a radio show on big data and big data analytics and that, those exact points come out very strong about there's such massive amounts of data that how do you actually, f you know, it used to be the needle in the haystack, now it's finding the needle in a pile of needles um, kind of issue in terms of uh, the, the, the challenge that's out there. Um, we're going to turn and talk a little bit about the future. Um, we've got about four, a little over 14 minutes, so we've got about a minute and a half, two minutes for each of you for sort of like a vision of where this is going. What's it look like in your head down the road? How are these programs going to change the landscape? What are they going to do for our country, the you know, American people, that kind of thing? Um, I'll start with Mike. Mike uh, for over Verizon, what's, uh, what's your crystal ball look like? Thanks what, for what, starting with me. What's it look like down the road? <laughs> at, at Verizon, we have a, a saying uh, that's our brand, better matters. And, and in no other segment uh, does better matter than serving the, the government segment and, the, and our first responder public safety community. So I envision um, that our public safety first responders have the network, uh, the devices, the applications, the security they need uh, to do their job, give back uh, to the community, uh, carry out their mission, and that on major news stations um, uh, all across the country, uh, people are reporting uh, the great work that uh, law enforcement, first responders, public safety are doing uh, to support the local communities, to defend against uh, terror, and to provide a safe uh, uh, living and working place for, for Americans. Leveraging the technology, the capabilities, the partnership, the collaboration. I think um, we do an injustice across uh, our national media on what um, all doesn't work in, in this uh, segment but there's certainly a, a lot more that does work. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of brave men and women serving uh, this country uh, nationwide, and it's up to companies like Verizon to be there side by side to help enable uh, them to do the hard work yeah, that they do. Excellent. Um, sometimes I feel like when we do this segment, we ought to have like patriotic music playing in the background, you know. <laughs> but that was well done. That was, that was very well done. The, uh, uh, Laurie, what do you think? Uh, what's it look like down the road for you? What's the future? Uh, where? where these programs you're working on, what are they going to mean to, to, to us, to the country down the future? It's, it's all about one thing. It's all about, for us, it's all about the, the person calling 911. That's, that's our responsibility. We also have the luxury of focusing on that as, as the bottom line. 
And so when I think ahead, I think to a system that is capable of doing the things that the public thinks it already is capable of, you know, thanks to CSI and 24 and shows like that, they think <laughs> it, it, it already is capable of doing those kinds of things. Um, so, you know, it's a system where it is possible for them to send a video to 911 and, and, and then the first responders can access it. But it's also even looking beyond that. When I think back, uh, when DOT first started down this road, we, we did a meeting, we pulled guys from, you know, out of their garages in Silicon Valley. And I will never forget because it, you know, we came back and, and all the feds were like, I remember one, one fellow saying, well, you know, they're talking about this crazy thing called the internet, what's that all about? Well, here we are. And and, uh, you know, we are moving down that road and I'm looking forward to not only what is possible once we put this in place, but what's over the next horizon. Yeah, excellent. I think that's, uh, I think you have to, you know, I mean, that's the, the way the world works these days. Uh, Wade Whitmer, what's it look like? What's the future look like to you? What's, uh, where's these, where are these programs going and what will it mean to all of us down the road? Right, I think, um, you know, the, the future is definitely more integration and then more leveraging of, of the networks they're building. As, as Lori mentioned, you know, like core, core mission for government is that public welfare, public health and safety. Uh, and information is one of those ways to do that. Um, talking, but you got you to share the information. So we need to be able to leverage whatever's being built. And then as I look down, uh, more things becoming network connected, more network serving things, um, uh, vision for alert and warning messages, and perhaps emergency communications across the board is uh, I look to get in uh, to the standards. So into the network protocols uh, where we can have uh, in devices, they, they are looking for alert and warning messages and the networks are prioritizing sending short alert and warning messages uh, and they can disseminate those to where they need to be, to the people that need to get them, when they need to get them. Uh, and then hopefully I, as, and the, as the iPause guy, can get out of any infrastructure. Uh, my mission can fall back to just authenticating those people that are allowed to send those messages uh, and then uh, using some, you know, we talked about network security, uh, just the authenticity and the integrity of that message, that's key when it gets to the public. They need to know that came from an, a, a valid public safety official and that's a real message from a guy that's in the know. Mm -hmm. What I picked up from the three of you is, um, you know, you're putting in place the tools, the infrastructure, the means mm -hmm. so that you can really focus on mission without worrying about the, the plumbing, so to speak, and the things that are that are there. Uh, Mark McNulty, um, I know Motorola Solutions must be thinking down the road, long-term plans, things go in place. What, what's the uh, future look like for you? Where is this all going and what will it mean? Well, so obviously given our heritage in LMR, um, as well as our participation on the AT&T team around FirstNet, we're thinking about that FirstNet enabled world. Sure. Um, we're involved in the, in the NG911 piece as well, and I've talked about it here today, you know, but we're kind of thinking about it in that end-to-end -end way. Um, and really, how do we bring the command center um, to the extent that we need to out to first responders uh, mm -hmm. on the front line? And, and more importantly, how do we make the technology that public safety and, and emergency responders use today, how do we make that complementary to the new technologies that are coming? Right. Um, I mean, we obviously envision a world where there will be the need for additional training of our public safety users and emergency responders to consume the technology. But as I said before, we're focused on how do we make that implementation of technology into the field as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and quite honestly, um, we're focused on how do we innovate um, in a standards-based world, right. right, which becomes increasingly more difficult. We think one of those areas is around, you know, vertical specific applications. So uh, public safety applications, I know APCO's been doing some great work there. FirstNet's obviously going to foster a public safety application ecosystem um, that we intend to participate in. Um, but other vertical apps that we serve as well, whether it's, you know, commercial industrial applications. So it's all, you know, for us it'll be about how do we leverage the networks that are there, how do we integrate them together, and how do we innovate and and we think a lot of that comes in applications. Yeah. Innovation and staying in front of that curve, staying in front of that uh, technology curve to make sure you're <coughs> bringing the products to the market to when the market needs them. Uh, TJ Kennedy, what's uh, the vision down the road here? I know um, yours is, has to be a big one because it's a big program <laughs> uh, sure. and it's an exciting program. So uh, what do you, how do you see this all shaping up down the road? 
I think in the public-private partnership that's first net, it's going to all be about enablement. And it's about enabling our first responders to do the amazing work that they do. And when you look at our police officers, our firefighters, our paramedics, and our EMTs, they go out and respond every single day with the tools that they have. And what I find is you give them better tools, they will use them for the things you thought of and probably 10 more things because they're so used to being able to respond with whatever they have. And I think that we have to enable that innovation and we have to enable that, that innate capability to find better ways to save lives and I really think this is going to create what I kind of call the internet of life-saving things and I think when we look at applications for public safety and we look at applications for the public whether it's for calling 911 whether it's for sharing data from um, sensors that they may be wearing or in the case of a firefighter paramedic or, or a police officer it could be sensors that that they wear when they respond every day that that internet of life-saving things is going to make their job safer more effective and more efficient and that will allow us in government so to speak to enable our first responders to do that great work that they do every day, but to do it better and to do it in a way that's going to make, make their life safer as they go about it. Yeah, excellent. Um, can I plagiarize that internet of life-saving things from sure. time to time? Go, I like go, that. go ahead and I use it. That's a pretty cool term there. That's a I pre- like it. That's a pretty cool t- uh, term. But I think you're right. I think that once the the structure's in place, the infrastructure's in place, I bet things people haven't even thought about right now are going to start happening and it's going to create a, a, a really exciting world to uh, just see what people can do once they have the capability in, in their hands. Uh, Rear Admiral Hewitt, um, as you look down the road into the future, what, what's happened down there? What, what, what do you see in your crystal ball as uh, going, uh, where, where are these programs all leading to? Well, today a citizen cannot send a picture uh, or a video to the 911 center of their lost child or loved one. Uh, nor can the 911 center send that picture or video out to public safety or citizens to help look for that child or loved one. Uh, another example would be uh, a citizen getting on the metro station uh, and sees uh, someone drop a suspicious package off. They can take a picture or video of that, but they can't send it to the 911 center. That could then send it on to uh, the law enforcement to help search for that, you know, and, and, if, and, to, and to quickly identify who that was and whether it was a, you know, could be a terrorist event. And so uh, by all of us around this table working together, that's actually in the near future here. I mean, FirstNet's coming online. It's going to enable uh, videos and pictures to be sent from uh, dispatchers out to the, to the, uh, law, uh, to the uh, law enforcement folks. And, and uh, we're working on alerts and warnings to be able to provide multimedia services so citizens can get that and keep them safe and secure. So all of us working together is going to make a big difference. At the same time, we're all focused on ensuring that our systems are going to be available around the clock, 7 by 24. It's unlike uh, your, you know, CIO yeah. days where, well, we're, uh, Saturday we'll take down our systems uh, maintenance. doing maintenance. Uh, sorry, no 911 calls. Uh, you know, <laughs> during that time. So all of us are, are at the same time looking at cybersecurity and, and, and privacy and addressing all those issues that we need to uh, uh, ensure the systems are, are available 7 by 24 uh, to provide the citizen safety. Yeah, that's exciting. It's, it's really been an exciting show to have all of you together because, you know, you all, every, all these programs complement one another and all... Uh, <laughs> Share together. Uh, as I always try to do, I try to do some summaries of uh, some of the key points. As, uh, as you were talking, I was taking some notes here, so I got to try to uh, <clears throat> see what I can do with uh, uh, summarizing some of the key things made. Uh, when we talked about progress, the progress was moving towards multimedia. I heard that over and over again. You know, where it's no longer going to be voice data; it's going to be integrated voice data, video, and so forth, um, and, and multimedia. Uh, I did hear a lot of working with the state and collaboration and interoperability uh, as, a, as a key progress going on. We heard about Safecom making progress and the things going on there, spectrum uh, availability, funding on for FirstNet. Um, uh, I heard interoperability over and over again. I guess if there's two things that really came out uh, on the show, it's um, listening to user needs and interoperability were, were, were mentioned multiple times. I like the progress around alerts and uh, alerts to cell phones. We talked about that quite a bit in terms of uh, the difference it can make. 
On specific things, we talked about new apps that are going to be uh, available and apps that are being generated for all these programs. Uh, we talked about real-time applications and getting data in real time, and we talked about how, how important that will be, especially in emergency situations. Uh, we talked about um, the grants uh, for 911 as well as for infrastructure upgrades to enable that. 911 Next Generation program, and of course uh, the big programs we talked about today were FirstNet, the, nine, the Next Generation 911, and iPaws. Um, in lessons learned, we talked about uh, the need for customer focus, that, uh, where that really hit home a number of times. And again, interoperability, but I think it was Rear Admiral Hewitt said interoperability is not just interoperability making the devices work together, it's the people side of it too, and, uh, and interoperability and collaboration there. Um, I was impressed with the publishing of the data from the, uh, the surveys and the ability to use that data to really fine tune and decide exactly what you uh, plan to do in the future future uh, and the lessons learned we he heard consistency and keep it simple. Um, we can't make this thing so complex that um, the individuals that are in an emergency situation um, have to do a lot in order to be able to use the, the devices. Challenges, funding came out uh, right away as, it, uh, as, as expected, uh, and also security. Um, we hit security and as we spoke we could have talked all probably for another hour just on security and all these programs, but that could be for another day. Um, we heard about transitioning on how to use the tools, which was an interesting concept because it's going to be different. So there will be training required and there will be transitions that we'll be needing. Uh, understand, understanding expectations was also one in creating uh, true expectations of what can be done and what can be done. and. Uh, and I like that uh, data overload discussion too. Um, there's going to be so much data that you're going to need people, governance issues, we're going to need, uh, it causes complexity, there's going to have to be analytics, there's going to have to be ways to sort through all that data and make sure the governance is in place, that the right data is being used at the right time. In terms of vision, we talked about focus on mission. I love the internet of life-saving things, but I think what I heard from all of you when it comes to vision, it's all about saving lives. That's what, it's, that's what, we're, what, what these programs are. With that, I want to uh, first thank the panelists for taking time from your busy schedules. I know you all have a very high-level position, so thanks for coming down and sharing your thoughts with us. I want to thank our sponsors, uh, without which we don't have a program. Uh, I want to thank the fine people here at Federal News Radio who do such a nice job and are taking care of us for, uh, during each show. And lastly, most importantly, I want to thank our listening audience that tune in each month and listen to the program. You've been listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM.